Excellent. There we go. Right, well, firstly, I would like to thank Sophie, Fiona and Louise. Um, without their technical expertise and know-how, uh, none of this would happen. Um, I am a complete um, dinosaur when it comes to this side of thing. I would be etch chiseling things out on rock to present to you, whereas um, these three lovely ladies actually make it all happen. Um, I think it would also write that I need to thank um, the Sandham books, which have been a great source of reference for me, um, and Colin Millett's book. And um, and just welcome to you all, really, wherever you are in uh, North America, in Europe, and to uh, Pasha the Hearing Dog um, Poodle, who I, I hope gets an awful lot from this talk. Um, what I've tried to do is just talk about some models that perhaps interest me, um, that have gotten that means something to me uh, and also that the one thing I had discovered whilst I was doing that there is such a massive range of models that were produced by this factory in the 20th century and the, the title is Worcester Models of the 20th Century so it wouldn't really be Philip Serrell if I didn't start off in the 19th century um, and just I mean one of the greatest models of the 19th century was James Hadley, who obviously set up his factory here, but another man who kind of was at the forefront in the late 19th century, but came into the 20th century was Sir Thomas Brock. And he um, lived in Pierpoint Street in Worcester, trained here in Worcester. Um, and, and this is a model, um, the young Mozart um, by Sir Thomas Brock, but probably Brock's most famous work is if you can imagine driving down the Mall towards Buckingham Palace and you see the Victorian monument just in front of the palace that was designed by Sir Thomas Brock and this model here if you look at it it's the young Mozart but if you look just underneath the plinth you can see the square and compass so this model is actually situated in the Masonic Museum here in Worcester and they have it on display because Tom, uh, the young Mozart was in fact a Freemason. So th th that that's come fr from the locality. Um, the next slide, I, oh, I'm going the wrong way. The next slide I want to show you is this, um, which is actually a maquette or a um, a base model for one of the 20th century's most prolific modelers, really, Frieda Doughty. Um, Frida was Dorothy's younger sister, and she produced a whole range of different models. The, the, the diversity of the images and, and figures that she produced is just unreal. This, this particular maquette um, was never actually put into production. It, it is Alice in Wonderland, and you can see Alice and the dodo, um, and, and all of these figures were produced individually and were available to be, to be bought. And in, in it, Sadly, it wasn't the most popular of models, and so it didn't sell in time that well. That, of course, means that in today's world, these models are incredibly rare because they weren't that popular. The more that sold back in the day, the more common they are today. But I think this is just a lovely maquette, and it kind of sums up Alice in Wonderland beautifully for me. Um, the next piece I wanted to show you, this is Eric Ormonier, and th this is a young horse in white. And I always think that if something isn't colored, it doesn't need decoration to display its form and its style. And, and this for me typifies how things change in the world. This has become, this shape to me now is, is very current. It's very cool, very trendy, um, and it doesn't need, color for it to be attractive this is actually if you look at the base it looks like it's a rocker it's actually an ink blotter so it would lift off that base blotting paper would fit underneath and when you've written your wonderful letter in, in with a fountain pen and ink which of course we all still do today um you, you would blot it with this um it, it's called the young horse it's probably his most famous work um but he was also famous for um, work in the underground. I think at East Finchley Station, he produced a, a study called The Archer. And his work um, is also on display with Art Deco pieces, I think, at the Daily Express building. But I think this is most definitely 
um, one of his most famous pieces of work. If we move on, um, Dorothy Doughty is a name that not just in Worcester, I would think that she ought to be and should be regarded as one of the 20th century's greatest ceramic modelers. And she produced, um, she was a great ornithologist. She, she was born in Italy. And this is a model from her American bird series. Um, I think this, this series started in about the, the late 1930s and ended in the, in the, in the 1950s and was specifically de designed for the American market with American birds. Um, do I like it? it it's, it's actually not my sort of subject, but I think I, I've included this here because I just think it's a, just a, a stunning, 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 you know, too many people look at things today through today's eyes. It's 2023. Don't look at this model through the eyes of someone who was around in 2023. Look at it through the eyes of someone who was around perhaps 80 years ago. And then look at the techniques that were required to produce this, how they modeled it. Um, I just think it's, it's a tour de force, it really is. Um, the next model is, it's, it's kind of appropriate in a way for me because this is a French soldier that was produced at the time of the First World War. Um, there are three different images in this series or different figures. Uh, the one that I really wanted to find, but I couldn't find it, is, is a soldier from the Worcestershire Regiment. Um, and, and, and what's really quite appropriate for me, we talk about the, the tomb of the unknown soldier in London. This is, these models, we don't know who produced them. So it's kind of the unknown modeler. And it's quite poignant, I think, to look back at these figures from the First World War period. This is the French soldier. Um, and I just think um, it, it's quite evocative of his period. Um, sadly, if you just look by his hand, you can just see that the end of his rifle has been broken off, but that kind of doesn't detract from it being, in my view, quite a poignant thing. Um, this is Neil French's Fontainebleau figures. Um, and, and again, I think these figures are quite current um they're quite cool in today's world i like neil french's work he also did the playtime series which were probably i think 1960s they were of young children playing there's a young girl dressed as a nurse there's a young boy playing with a pond yacht and the a, a complete set of these is very very rare i like neil french because neil french was a big cricket fan i'm a big cricket fan and neil french produced um, works and wares for the MCC and for Worcestershire Cricket Club or Worcestershire County Cricket Club um, in terms of bowls and plates or whatever. And, and so for me, um, I, I just think I, I have that kind of connection with Neil French because he loves his cricket and, and I too love my cricket. Um, I'm a farmer's boy. So when I was about eight, um, my grandfather gave me a calf to look after and when i came home from school every day i had the job of feeding this calf you know and it became like most people had cats and dogs i had this this calf to look after i kind of think it was cheap labor that my grandfather got because i used to feed it and look after it and all the rest of it and um and at the end of the day i didn't get the benefit from it but there we go this is um by doris lidner who uh, I just think the scope and variety of her work is absolutely unreal. This is from the um, Young Farm Animals or Zoo Babies series. Um, this is a map figure. Um, it would be painted, um, but it just, you know, it, this kind of sums up. It, this reminds me of my childhood. That's why it's there. I absolutely love it. And, um, and I was lucky enough, I bought one of these figures, a coloured one, about two years ago, and it's kind of got pride of place on my mantelpiece at home. Um, the next series, again, this is by Lidner. Um, and uh, this is At the Meat and The Huntsman. These were produced from the 1930s through to the 1970s. Uh, and, and I always think it's strange because in Worcester, you get ordinary figures that were just kind of mass produced. And then you get limited editions where the edition is specific to 25 
or 100 or 500, but these are an unlimited edition. And I can never quite work out what the difference is between kind of a mass produced model and an unlimited edition. Um, but I guess it's just a bit of a marketing ploy. Um, th this is um, the huntsman with the hound and at the meet. And I think this lady, um, she's so stylish riding side saddle um, with a horse dipping down. Uh, and again, it's quite, you know, it's quite current. Hunt hunting might not be, <coughs> excuse me, this is a, a good Worcestershire cough and cold, by the way. It's not a computer or any other sort of virus. Um, I, I just think these are, are very evocative and current figures for today. Uh, and and they're, they're, they're my favourites. Um, to show the extent of Lidner's work, um, she did a, a series of limited editions called the Prize Cattle Series. Um, and funnily enough, they were all bulls except the Jersey cow. The, the Jersey cow was the only non-bull amongst them. And, and, and I kind of, this means something to me because I was at school, you'll have to bear with me here. I was at school with a young man called William Pratt when I was about six or seven. And his parents bred pedigree Jersey cattle in Starport. And I think that one of these two models was modelled by Doris Lidner from one of their herd. So that, that kind of has a connection for me as well. Um, and just while I talk about these, just bear, just remember, if you can, um, this wooden base that they're on. Um, and I'll reference that later on. You, you lift these models out of the wooden base and you can see it'll tell you what they are, who the model is, who the shape number is, and it's a limited edition. They will also be accompanied by a little frame certificate, um, which tells you which number they are in the series of the limited edition. Um, from the equestrian series, um, we have, this is Princess Anne on doublet. And there were a number of show jumping and three day eventing models. There was Marion Coates mold on stroller, there was um, Captain Raimondo Dinzeo on Murano. And there was a uh, Colonel Harry Llewellyn on Fox Hunter. Um, for those of you who remember Princess Margaret's fling with a, um, a, a, a landscape gardener called Roddy Llewellyn, I think Roddy Llewellyn's father was Harry Llewellyn, who was the Worcester model. Uh, and, and the reason why I've kind of put this there is if you, if you get the chance to look at this model, you have the horses leaping out over a, a kind of water jump and the action that is it, it's almost like a freeze frame photograph that someone has taken and and you have this wonderful action of this horse leaping out over the water but it's in porcelain you know and it's it's like this frame has frozen and 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 doris has completely captured all the action and all the motion in this kind of in this split second moment um, and i think that makes that really very very special um this is um from the game bird series this is a pheasant um by ronald van ruckeveld and um there were pintail ducks i think there were mallards and various game birds in this series uh, and again it's just at, at this at this point in time I suppose from about 1959, 1960 through to about the late 1980s, Royal Worcester produced these limited editions. And you could pretty much have a limited edition <clears throat> uh, uh, of any, well, anything that you wanted. But the range of subjects from game birds to uh, horses to bulls to all sorts of things is quite unbelievable. And it was almost, in, in my eyes, the limited editions of this period were almost like a manufactured market. It created a certain amount of exclusivity. Uh, and if we talk about exclusivity, um, this is the, the white silver wedding anniversary um, doves to commemorate the uh, silver wedding of the Queen and Prince Philip. Um, they were made in 1952. Uh, and I think the dish, this edition is probably about 25 um and <clears throat> i can remember when i started work 1976 between 1976 and 1980 i think we sold 
limited editions from this series for about twenty thousand um, pounds, and it's a market that's kind of fluctuated greatly. I've always believed that anything that, be, that that's kind of attached to royalty will always maintain and hold its value. Um, another limited edition from the early days uh, when I started work. Um, this is by Bernard Winskill. It's from the Military Commanders series, and this is Napoleon. And, and if again, if you look at this model, you can just see that it's kind of his feet and his tail. The tail is very clever in the way that it almost pr provides a balancing act at the rear on that rocky outcrop. And, and, and the, the expertise in producing something like this that free stands on its own is, is just, I think it's just quite un unreal, really. Um, th the first four in this series were um, Napoleon, Wellington, Marlborough and Washington. And Washington was my, sorry, Marlborough was my kind of least favourite of the four because it was slightly bigger than all the rest and it seemed to lose its scale. And this might seem very strange, but I also felt that Marlborough needed a shave. And he, and he clearly got up early that morning and hadn't had his shave. He's on his horse and he's kind of got this five o'clock shadow or stubble there. And he's not quite as clean and crisp as the other models. Um, others in this series that came on were Eugene de Beauharnais, Richard de Lionheart. Um, or, or, uh, and I think that Worcester almost thought that they, you know, this was a spectacular model. And once Worcester had got on to this theme, it was almost like there was no stopping them. And, um, and, and, there were Alexander the Great, there were just a nut, so many different um, commanders that were introduced into this series. And whilst the first four sold really, really well, I'm not sure that the others did. And of course, if you're going to create some sort of exclusivity, if you're going to create a series of models, well, the trick is to get someone to buy the first three, because then they've got to kind of buy the next seven in this series to complete their set of 10. If you think about it, it's quite clever modeling. Um, I think these are, are really kind of, for me, they're kind of evocative um, figures. These are uh, the wartime series modeled by Eileen Soper. Uh, and I think at the age of 15, she had etchings exhibited at the Royal Academy. Um, she was an illustrator for Enid Blyton. And you can see quite clearly in, in, in my eyes, you know, you can almost see George Timmy, and Julian and Dick um, in, in these figures here. Um, and I think they're absolutely lovely. Uh, and I'll take you through the series. Um, so the first one is called Spitfire. Uh, the next one is Rescue. And you can see the young girl just rescuing a, uh, a kitten from a, uh, obviously the, the, the ruins of a bombed uh, house, possibly in London. Uh, and then we've got Take Cover. That's quite sad, I think. Um, we've got the evacuees. Um, we've got the letter, um, salvage, and we've got stowaways. Now, these models weren't that popular. Um, at the end of the day, some of them had to be given away. The museum only has one of these models. And one of the joys of, of kind of doing what I do as an auctioneer is that these set models just walked into my sale room a week ago and um, and I had to look at them. And, and, and for me, it's a real honour and a privilege to look at things like that. And because I'm in Worcester, you tend to you, you see things that things that were, you know, if they weren't popular and they were given away. It, the chances are it was given to someone locally and, you know, they never get thrown away. These Worcester things get absolutely treasured. Um, but the, 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 the kind of sad part about this, I think, is that there was an eighth figure, um, which was, it was called Missing. And it's kind of, in, in a way, it was, I think it was decided that it was a bit too heart-wrenching to produce and it never, never made um, formal production. But, you know, the other thing about this, this series for me is that you've got these really kind of innocent Enid Blyton type faces. And then behind that, you've got the horror of war and you've got kind of that, not a contradiction, but it's it, it's it just it, for me, it just gets a message across. 
that how terrible times must have been during that period in the war. Uh, and I talk about um, uh, the joy of being in Worcester, right? So, so this is a bronze dog by Ken Potts. Uh, uh, and, and if you talk to, I mean, this is just fantastic for me because I was in my sale room this afternoon, three hours ago, and who walked through the door? Ken Potts, you know, and I said to him, oh, I'm doing a bit of a talk this evening, Ken. Um, could you just tell me what do you think's your greatest model? He said, no, well, it wasn't a piece of Worcester. So I asked him what it was. And he said it was a destroyer memorial ship that he did at RAF Chatham. Now, of course, the name Potts might not be that familiar with you, familiar to you. But if you walk down Worcester High Street, and when I started in business in Worcester, if you walk down Worcester High Street, you're going to run over because there were cars there. But if you walk down Worcester High Street now and you look towards the cathedral, you'll be sharing the view with this man, Sir Edward Elgar. And Elgar, this model, was by Ken Potts. And I just think it's actually, you know, it, it's fantastic. And I'm kind of proud of Ken and I'm proud of Worcester and I'm proud of the museum because, you know, he produced this. Now, you imagine walking down Worcester High Street and seeing a lifestyle statue of someone that you've made. I just think that's absolutely unbelievable. And I love that type of thing. Um, we'll go back to Doris Lidner now. And if you remember, I talked about the um the the turn the, or the wooden bases, the uncolored wooden bases on the bottom of limited editions. These are ebonized bases, um, which is quite rare, really. And this is the Horse Garden Lifeguard. Again, limited editions produced by Doris Lidner. Um, and I, it, it's quite interesting. These are really, really sought after. And I guess they're sought after because if you were a horse guard or a lifeguard, you would want one of these models to kind of commemorate your time there. Um, they're a pair and they were sold as a pair. But sadly, I think through the annals of at time, some of them have got um, kind of split up and they get sold separately. Um, but I, uh, for me, they convey everything that horse guards and lifeguards are all, the blues and the greys, it's what it's all about. And I just think they're, they're absolutely beautiful. Um, going back to my farming roots, I love heavy horses. And um, you've got, this, this is again, Doris Lidner. Um, if you're gonna buy one of these, always check that the ribbons on the main are intact and all there. Um, this is the, I think this is the Shire from the Heavy Horse series. There was the Clydesdale, the Persia on the Suffolk Punch and the Shire Stallion. Uh, and they're just absolutely beautifully majestic creatures. And if you look at the, um, the top of the, the, uh, the thigh of the, bit of the animal, you can just see there's some, some fantastic muscle tone there. And um, again, it's another one of my favorites. Um, if, if I revert back to my roots, You'll forgive me if I'm going to about to be slightly indelicate here, but um, this is a Hereford bull. I, it, actually, it's always I, it always interests me that the first one in this series of, of any model is normally the, the one that's rare. And the, this is from the prize cattle series. Um, we've already had the, the Jersey bull and the Jersey cow. And this is a Hereford bull. The first one in this series was the Aberdeen Angus bull. And then you've kind of got the Brahman bull and the Santa Gertrudis bull, which, you know, you don't see too many of those in the fields of Worcestershire. Um, but the Hereford bull, th this was a model of 500 of these. And, and I will tell you a little story here, which probably doesn't cover me in glory. Um, but these used to come in cardboard boxes with a polystyrene cutout that the model dropped into. And I was unpacking one of these, oh gosh, 30 years ago. And, and I was conscious as I was pulling the bull out of this polystyrene packing, which was cut out to the shape of the bull, that there was a little bit of resistance. Now, instead of stopping and seeing where the resistance came from, I kept pulling. And, and, and what I hadn't realized was that I caught its nether regions around the polystyrene, and there was a kind of a twang as they shot past my left ear. And 
And so I turned the Hereford bull into, a, I suppose, a bullock is the correct term. And um, so if, if you, it, it, so the addition, I can tell you for sure, there aren't actually 500 of these, there are actually 499, because I broke one of them. Um, this is a, uh, um, a sporting dog series, again, by um, Doris Lidner. This is the pointer. And I don't know if any of you have ever walked on the moors with a pointer, but I mean, this just completely captures um, the whole essence of the way they point at a bird. Um, uh, and um, it just, again, it's another snapshot moment that just, it, it, if you think about it, you know, it, it, this is a, a almost like a 3D version of a camera, you know, and these models, they've got such fantastic skill to produce this. Um, if we move on, this is um, Chiff Chaff on Hogweed from the English Bird series by Dorothy Doughty. Interestingly enough, the, the English Bird series was modelled by Dorothy Doughty, but, that, but I don't think they were produced until after her, her death. Um, this is the Chiff Chaff on Hogweed. And if you look at this, that model stands probably, what, 18 inches to two foot high, and it sits on a little porcelain base the size of probably a teacup. And the whole thing sits in a wooden um, uh, plinth. And yet the, when you model this, you know, Dorothy Daddy didn't just have to think about what does a chiff chaff look like? What does the hogweed look like? But she had to make the thing work in terms of it sitting there, not falling over. And believe it or not, it's actually quite sturdy in that position, but nonetheless, let me tell you, after my Hereford Bull experiences, it ended another not unpacking nightmare. Um, this is by Eva Soper um, from her Small Bird series. And, um, you, you know, you, there's almost no house in Worcester that you can go to where you don't see a Soper bird. Um, they're in every house in Worcester and... Um, uh, they're really quite sweet and for me I'm not all about value but I think these things are um it, 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 it's it's the Worcester connection with the city it's the Worcester connection with the people of Worcester it's the Worcester connection with the people who worked at the factory and I just love the fact that you know it's almost like if you live in Worcester, you're really proud of the factory and you've got to go and own a bit. And, and this is kind of entry level ownership for um, local Worcester folk. Um, this isn't entry level. This is from the Victorian figure series by Ruth Van Rackevelt. Um, and it's interesting. These were produced, I suppose, in the 70s. And I mentioned earlier that the <coughs> that the first models in any series were always most valuable. So the first models in, this is called the Tea Party. Um, the first models in this series were Penelope, Lizette, Beatrice and Caroline. And back in the seventies, I think, I sold those four models, I think for the thick end of 20,000 pounds. And the way the markets change is that today, I guess they'd be worth under a thousand pounds. And one of the reasons for that is that I think collectors, we don't live in an age anymore where people collect things to put in cabinets. And, and so these collect people don't display figurines in the way that they used to, certainly not in my opinion of this style. The next screen that we might come onto might be a little bit more current. But there's a knock on effect. So not only did they not put things in cabinets, but it means that cabinets don't sell so well either. Uh, and it, it's just an interesting to me, kind of a little bit of social um, background. Um, this next one, uh, which is, I just turn up my page of notes here. This is by Ethelwyn Baker. Um, and this is called uh, The Loop Player from her Victorian Musician series. Um, I think she was, from what, from what I've read, she was a lady of some sort of style uh, and clearly, um, you know, wanted to impress her mark in that when she signed um, her work, she, she did it with a monogram in a circle on the base. And I think the painters were instructed that they had to pick out that monogram in colour so that people knew it was her work. 
Now, when I, if you go back to the last screen, um, so you've got these Victorian ladies, or you've got the lute player. I, I, I think this lute player is much more current in today's market. It's the, it's the type of thing that is kind of of, in my eyes, of today's style. Um, and I quite like that. Um, the next model. Philip, Philip, I'm just going to interject. We've had a question about approximate date ranges for some of the objects as you're going through and also an indication of size. Uh, OK, so this model would be about five or six inches high. And I'm kind of guessing that she would be. 30s and 40s, the 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 um the tea party would be the majority of the limited editions are from 69 through to about 85, something like that. Uh, and a lot of the free the, the doughty figures and some of the other figures, uh 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, but they were produced for such a long period of time. This this um the tea party, I guess, would be about eight, nine inches high, and it came in its special presentation box with the certificate fitted at the front. Really good marketing exercise. Um, so this is, this again would be about the same height. Um, this is called um, uh, Harlequin. It's by Frederick Gertner. Um, uh, and Frederick Gertner, if, if you know Worcester, um, if you come running parallel to Fourgate Street in Sansom Walk, and in Sansom Walk, you've got the VI Institute. Um, and that's where Gertner attended classes. This particular model uh, would, I guess, be, again, another eight to 10 inches high. Um, not my favorite, but I've sort of kind of put it in here, is Masquerade. Um, and this is by um, Donald Brindley. Uh, Again, kind of early days printed, uh, sorry, um, modelled, um, and quite stylistically for that lady. Um, the next one is Frida Doughty. Um, and and uh, this is another kind of must have. We have days of the week, months of the year. This is November. I don't know how many thousands of these were produced, but this is about four inches high, five inches high. Um, I put it there because my daughter was born in November and one of the, and, and it's another, it's another clever marketing trick this, you know, because, so my daughter was born on a Tuesday in November. So you've got to kind of got to buy November, but then you've got to buy Tuesday's child, which is a girl ballerina. And, and then, so having bought that, you then get into the rest of the series and, and Frida Doughty produced months of the year, days of the week um and they 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 their kind of value fluctuates from any, whether they're a pink mark which would be 40s 50s or a black mark post 1970s um and they their value i suppose ranges from 15 pounds to 16 pounds but i just think they're they're a great kind of they make great christening presents um this is going back to um the victorian figure series um by Ruth Van Rackabel. And I'm not sure whether I said earlier that um that there's a school of thought that says that the young girls in these um models were actually Ruth Van Rackabel's daughter. And Ruth Van Rackabel for a period of time lived opposite the boys' college in Malvern. Um, so this is a limited edition, would have come in a box, would be about 10 inches high, and I would think dates to 19 mid-1960s. Um, the next model, again, it's a, another unknown model. This is a, a new Baver. Um, and, and I think this is, again, you know, I, I, I talk about big things being current, but I think in terms of current taste, I think this is quite current, whereas the previous Victorian figure probably isn't current. Um, we don't know who this is by, um, and it would have been produced around about 1918, 1920 four or five inches high. Um, and the next um, image is um, by Doris Lidner. This is um, Columbine. Um, and I, you know, it, it's, I don't associate 
Doris Lidner with figures like this. So I put this in there because for me, that's not Doris Lidner. Um, but it's 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 just a it's again one of these figures, six, seven inches high. Um, but but it's it's just not what I anticipate of her. Um, this next slide, um, which is also Lidner, you see, if you go back to that one, uh, and it is all about taste and times and fashion. I think that I think that this particular model has kind of again, it's a little bit yesterday's taste. But how cool is this figure, the dancers? You know, that's very very current. Um, and it, and when I started. I sold different figures, people collected figures. What happens now is that you, you sell an item, you sell it, you, people have to buy into a look. And I think this is one of today's looks. I think it's really, really lovely. Um, and there's a great deal of movement in there and it's got some style to it. Um, this is by Pinder Davis um and, it, and it's called the um, balinese dancers and this is about four or five inches high um she also did siamese dancers which were much much bigger but again typified by these kind of ivory colored hands and face uh and by the um uh the the, the, the gilt clothing um it was kind of hoped in a way that these would catch on in the same way that um frida doubt is um days of the week and months of the year caught on but they didn't actually and you know the number of the for, for every 10 of these that you see or come into my sale room 11 of them have got their hands broken off um and so it, they're, they're kind of very fragile in that respect um the next model is by uh ronald van rackerville uh, and you know I kind of imagine Bob Newhart, you know, going, are you what, what, you want us to make some fish, you know, and why, why would a company in Worcester make game fish? Well, I suppose they made the blue marlin, the sailfish and the others to appeal to American game fishers on the basis that they had lots of money to buy these models. These again are 60s and 70s um and you do see them uh, and, and in terms of a model it's a fantastic piece of structure the way it holds it all together um but I'm, but again I'm, i think they for me it's jumping on the back of the of the bandwagon uh of producing limited editions and and i mean i think in you know you've got to cast your mind back to 1963 to 1980 it's a different mindset then to what we have now and I think back in those days, Royal Worcester could have produced a house brick with a Worcester stamp on it, called it a limited edition and given you a certificate and someone would have bought it, you know, because it was a really strong brand. It still is, of course, but those limited editions, um, there was a worldwide demand for them. But the, this particular series was, was specifically geared in my book to kind of, um, you know, big American game fishermen. Um, the next model I, I kind of um, really came across here um, in that I didn't know of this existence, um, but this this figure, we, you know, I, I had a great ex expression the other day, somebody said to me, oh, this is unique, there's only two of these. Well, this is unique, there's only one of these, um, and it's a pigeon, and it's modeled by Doris Lidner. Uh, and it's and it's unique because she absolutely hated loads and detest the thing. And and I think someone kind of um, you know, never got into production. And she kept this um, a friend of hers kept this one model and kept it on a, on a mantelpiece. And uh, I think um Doris Lidner got to hear about it, and uh it didn't go down very well because she really, really did not appreciate it. Um these are Shinwasari figures um, modeled by Gwendolyn Parnell. Um, they are about four inches high. Again, the hands seem to be very, very fragile of these. Um, Gwendolyn Parnell's um, grandmother was a lady in waiting to Queen Victoria. And, and she lived actually about 45 yards from where I'm sitting at the moment. So again, you've got that lovely connection 
with Worcester, which is something that is really important to me. Uh, Doris Lidner loved her animals. I think this is a Dandy Dinmont and a Pekingese um, produced in the 50s. And these are about two or three inches big. Um, and I, I love her animals. Some of them have been converted into brooches. Um, and you've got all sorts, you've got terriers, all sorts, and I really, really love them. Um, you can see that I'm a country boy because I love my animals and my dogs and my horses. But um, this next slide actually moves on to something else. It kind of kind of reminds me of my mother, really, because my mother had this this thing about collecting Frida Doughty months of the year nursery rhyme series. <clears throat> and this is um, from the Countries of the World series by Frida Doughty. Uh, and this was. Uh, this is Scotland, and um, an apocryphal story here is that my mother, she must have had about 50 or 60 Frida Doughty figures, and um, Henry Sandon asked her if he could um, illustrate some of them in her book, or in his book rather, which he did, and she was absolutely delighted, and she rang me up really, really pleased, and she said, oh, Henry said, can I give you an acknowledgement in the book? And I said, well, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And she said, why is that? And I said, well, the name Cyril isn't exactly common. And you're kind of telling the world that you've got a collection of Worcester porcelain. Anyway, I got put in my place and the acknowledgement duly appeared. And about eight weeks after the book came out, she got burgled and she lost all of her figures. So, you know, if you're going to put your illustration anywhere, I, I think in today's security conscious world, um, it's probably best to keep it to yourself. Um, I absolutely love this. I absolutely love this. This is Giraffes by Stella Croft. Um, she was an Irish freelancer in the 30s. Um, the factory was under huge pressure at that time to, um, well, to make money. Uh, and so they used a lot of freelance um, modelers and workers. Um, if you look at this, it kind of just captivates me everything that a giraffe is everything you know it's just it's just so so lovely and yet it's really really simple because it's just a design of three giraffes leaning against a rock um it's it, it's the model captures the motion um and it just kind of i just think they are She's got it absolutely spot on. I really, really love those. Um, and that would be about, what, seven or eight inches high. I think probably her best model. Um, this just makes me laugh. You know, it makes me smile. You see, uh, is it Bonzo? And it, it's by an unknown modeler. Um, they're only three or four inches high. Um, this one's a pepper. Um, you can just about see the holes in the top of his little head. Um, they're not all peppers, but I think that that is just, I, it, it's just a, you know, if you feel, if you had a bad day, look at Bonzo, he'll make you smile. Um, this next one is, so I went to a school called Seabright School, um, which was in North Worcestershire. Um, it closed down while I was there, and I don't think it was my fault. Um, but this is a model of, this is a, a plaque of Stanley Baldwin. And I, I put it in here because at that school, there was a Stanley Baldwin hat, Stanley Baldwin, prime minister, a Worcestershire man. Um, and um, in the, in the it, it kind of at the same period in 1937, we've got this plaque of King George. Um, and it's that these are both about six or seven inches diameter. Um, and they were modelled by a man called uh, Richard Garb. Um, his father was a Prussian ivory worker. Um, and he's got work. Um, Garb himself had work in the Tate. Um, and he won um, prizes for his wood carving and the like. Um, the next piece is by, I'll turn my page, Sybil Williams and um, Jessamine Bragg. And this is one of two series. Um, there's June and Noel, 
and they were the only models that Worcester produced at that time that were in two sizes. They were either about three or four inches high, uh, or about eight or nine inches high. Um, I, I could never quite understand how two people could make the same model, but this is by um, Sybil Williams and Jessamine Bray. Um, it's June and Noel, and Noel, this is Noel, which is um, obviously the Christmas version, but also Noel, the girl's name, and June is the summer version, and you've kind of got the, that juxtaposition of, of the young girl's name and the season at the same time. Um, this next piece also, or these next two, they've got to be two of the kind of the commonest models there are. Frida Doughty, Grandmother's Dress, and the Parakeet Boy. And the Parakeet Boy kind of has another connection for me because when I was a, a oh, it must have been six or seven, and I, I was playing football in my mother's dining room, as you do. And and I caught this football just right and it hit the parakeet boy and it fell on the floor and it broke the tail of the parakeet. And these were my mother's pride and joy. And I, I kind of hadn't got the, um, the honesty in me, I suppose, to tell her that I'd broken her pride and joy. And I put it back on the shelf and scarf it outside. And I'm not sure she ever noticed. Um, but when she, she passed away some, what, eight to ten years ago, I had the job of selling these things. I couldn't quite bring myself to selling a parakeet boy with its broken tail, which wouldn't have made very much anyway. But it, it's just every house in Worcestershire, they've got grandmother's dress and the parakeet boy. Um, the, the next um, model that I want to show you is two ladies in a mod cap. Uh, and it's quite, this is about four or five inches high. Again, an, unmo an unknown um, modeler. Um, and it's, it's kind of, for me, it sums up that late 18th, 19th century period. Um, and, uh, but again, I think it's, it, it's yesterday's taste. Um, the next model is Sleepy Boy by uh, Margaret Kane. This would have been uh, modelled in the 1950s. And, and you've got this, uh, just a, quite a simplistic little boy falling asleep. And he's decorated in different colours, painted in different colours. Um, but again, a model that was very, very popular. Um, I just got a couple of more slides to show you. Um, I love this. This is again Doris Lidner. This is um, from her zoo babies. These are a pair of young um, tiger cubs. And she just, for me, kind of sums up everything that's, I don't know, warm, nice about the, the natural world uh, and, and why we should try and look after our animals. We don't always do that. Um, but I just think this is just such a, a lovely little model. It's about three or four inches um, in width. And um, and it's like my zoo baby's calf that I had earlier. Um, it's something that I love. Um, this is the last slide for me, really, or the last two slides. Um, this is the, the queen uh, when she was Princess Elizabeth on Tommy um, in her, uh, her uniform of um, Colonel in Chief of the Grenadier Guards. Um, this was introduced in 1949 and it was modelled, um, it was from the Trooping of the Colour in 1947. Um, back in the day, late 1970s, this would have been worth the thick end of £20,000. Um, and it's how things change because I think the value would have dipped to five years ago, perhaps to under £5,000. But I'm sure now, with the affection that everyone has for the Queen, that that model um, would, would be increasing in value. Um, and just to sum it up for you, um, what a great modeler Doris Lidner was. This is um, a, a much bigger maquette of that model. And, and it kind of, 
doesn't need color to make it as special and as spectacular as it is. Incidentally, I'm slightly sold on this model because Harry Davis painted this and Harry Davis was kind of, um, he was one of my heroes. So you've got Doris Lidner and Harry Davis and you can't beat Lidner and Davis in my book. So this then is um, a model of um, Prince Elizabeth on Tommy. You can see all the muscle definition there. The Queen is sitting side saddle. Um, for me, that is just, um, there's no better piece to end on than that. Um, thank you for bearing with me. I hope I haven't bored you too much. And um, well, there we go. Thank you. <laughs>